Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time. In each episode of this podcast, we invite a special guest to take us on a tailored tour of the past. Travels Through Time is brought to you in partnership with History Today, Britain's best loved serious history magazine. You can read articles relating to this podcast and more about our guests at historytoday.com forward slash travels. There is also a special subscription offer for Travels Through Time listeners. Three issues for just one pound each. Hello, my name is Peter Moore and welcome to a Wolfson History Prize special episode of our podcast Travels Through Time. The Wolfson History Prize is the UK's most prestigious history award. Last month, it was presented to Professor Mary Fulbrook for her book, Reckonings, Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice. Mary is one of Britain's most distinguished historians. She's Professor of German History at UCL's School of European Languages, Culture and Society. She's published extensively on all aspects of 20th century German history, and today she's regarded as one of the world's leading scholars of the crimes and consequences of what we now call the Holocaust. This is a disturbing subject of Reckonings, a book that she said she was driven to write by an enduring sense of injustice, that the vast majority of those who perpetrated the Holocaust or who made it possible evaded responsibility for their crimes. Reckonings was called Masterly by the Wolfson Prize judges, a work that explores the shifting boundaries and structures of memory. I met Mary in a little studio in Notting Hill last week to talk about Reckonings. I should say at the start that this following conversation with her engages with some of the bleakest moments in recorded history. But I also hope that it serves as a warning and as a reminder of where intolerance and prejudice can lead us. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Okay, so this is a special episode of Travels Through Time where we've decided to break loose from our usual format to give us a bit more latitude, really, to talk about the topic that you explore in Reckonings more widely. Whereas we usually examine one year and three scenes, today we're going to focus on three crime scenes, a ghetto, a labour camp and an extermination camp. And then we're going to reflect on them in through the form of a 1960s published memoir, two 1960s court cases and a 1999 memoir. My first question really is that the Holocaust is the bleakest, blackest, most disturbing moment in our human story, I think. You've started writing about this when and what drew you towards this history? In one sense, I've always been concerned with it. At no time in my life did I not know about the Holocaust, and so it always concerned me. But for many, many years, I avoided focusing on it directly. I wrote about all sorts of aspects of German history before and after, but couldn't really come to look at the heart of the matter. It was really in the first decade of this century when I was researching a book on generations through the 20th century and I was looking at generations through dictatorships, through the Third Reich, through the GDR, that I stumbled on something quite personal, namely a cache of letters that my mother had in her loft after she'd died. I came across this bunch and suddenly realised that my mother's former best school friend in Berlin had been married to a significant senior Nazi civil servant who had been the chief administrator of a county just north of Auschwitz. And I was totally shocked by this discovery. My mother herself was a refugee from Nazi Germany. She fled from the Nazis. This was her very best school friend. We knew the family well, and they had never, ever revealed that the husband had been a significant Nazi. He went on to a glittering career in the West German civil service. But it led me to explore more and more, and in the end I landed up writing two books simultaneously. One, Dissonant Lives, the general book about generations through the 20th century, and alongside that another book, A Small Town Near Auschwitz, Ordinary Nazis in the Holocaust. Okay, so this is the background to Reckonings, and I think you've established right there how morally difficult the story is, and the, the source material is very, very difficult as well. But we're going to um, face up to it in these in these three episodes, I'm going to call them. And do you want to tell us what your first one is? One of them is the ghetto 
in the Polish city, which is spelt L-O-D-Z, but pronounced Wutsch, okay. and which the Germans renamed Litzmannstadt, the Vaterland, which was incorporated into the Greater German Reich. So okay. it's an area of Poland that the Germans decided to incorporate within the boundaries of the Greater German Reich. It's not in the general government. The ghetto in the Germanized, renamed city, Litzmannstadt, is an area where the Jews were herded into the poorest, worst section of town and basically fenced off. And for a while, the civilian administration simply starved and humiliated them. They then thought if they could set them to work, this would assist the German war effort. But the Jews themselves thought the more they worked, the longer they would last, the longer they would survive. They were so essential to the German war effort. We're familiar in a way from films like The Pianist with the idea of ghettos. And something that struck me when I was reading through is you, you have the very big ones, but they they also had ghettos in very small areas as well. So how was this particular one in comparison to the others? Was it a very large ghetto and how many people were the, living there? There are it? a very large number of different kinds of ghettos and some ghettos are very short-lived. They're just holding pens prior to deportation. Other ghettos last longer. They're used for a period of time for various different reasons. The Litzmannstadt ghetto or the Wutsch ghetto is comparable to Warsaw because it's significant. It's one of the very largest. It, in terms of the size of the ghetto, pre-war population somewhere up to 250 50,000, let's say 220 to 250,000. Yeah. At the start of the war, many have fled. As the Germans come in, many Jews flee. They try and go to somewhere where they think they will be safer, relatives going east, whatever. The actual numbers in the ghetto itself fluctuate because while they initially put in perhaps 160,000, the numbers are constantly going down through death, disease, typhus, starvation, or going up through deportations of Jews from elsewhere which are, who are brought into the ghetto, particularly from the autumn of 1941, September 1941, when German Jews for the first time are stigmatised with the Yellow Star and begin to be deported eastwards and other groups as well. How were these ghettos administered? The ghetto administration is in two different parts, if you like. One is through the German civilian administration. There's a guy called Hans Bibo who's significant in this particular ghetto. But within the ghettos, the Germans have this really disagreeable process of ensuring that it is self-administration through a Jewish council. And in particular in this one, the person who is imposed as the leader of the Jewish council is a former businessman, Rumkowski, who is very full of himself. Is he the one who has the local currency within the ghetto named That's after it. him? Yes, That's yes, right. and he rides around in a in a little carriage and lords it over his ghetto population. He's a very, very controversial figure. In some accounts, he is portrayed as somebody who has a care for the children, is very concerned about the children in the orphanages and so on. In other accounts, it's shown that he's sexually abusing some of the people in his sphere of influence, that he's doing favours to his buddies and his mates, that he's... But I think whatever we think of Rumkowski as an individual, more insidious is the fact that the Germans set up this system of getting the Jews to administer their own downfall, getting the Jews themselves to be in charge of selecting numbers to be deported and gassed, getting the Jews themselves to administer the scarce resources, who gets what to eat, who does what, who gets where to live and what job. And that is the really insidious thing about it. I think there is no single leader of a Jewish council who is in a position to do anything that could not be criticised. So at this time life is progressing and you mentioned before there's always this hope that things are going to improve and you mentioned in the book as well there's these among this bleak context you do have these charming moments of a one of your characters is translating Ovid into Polish and people are working they're trying to improve themselves they're trying to get on as best as possible but it is a hopeless situation isn't it? There is no way that anyone could have conceived of the madness that was taking people to places where they would be put to death by gassing or shot or in any other way brutally murdered. So initially people thought we have to weather this storm, we have to live through it, we have to survive somehow. What we have from 
Litzmannstadt, which is a, a very detailed ghetto chronicle of the day-to-day -day events, happenings, the decline of the ghetto population. We also have diaries, and the particular case you mention is from the diary of a young teenager, a very brilliant teenager still at school trying to earn some extra money by tutoring less bright pupils but also in his spare time doing these literary translations he's someone who commands at least four languages well and chronicling in his diary his own decline his own absolute feelings of desperation hunger weakness and in the end he like so many others simply starves to death in the ghetto this is a form of death which quite clearly in my mind should have been seen it's murder. It should have been seen as criminally liable, but it is murder by slow starvation, and the civilian administration were not adequately brought to account for imposing that particular form of death. Others, when they were sick, when they were weak, were taken to the local railway station, were taken to a not very far away the first of the extermination camps, Shelm, though, where they were put in vans and gassed with exhaust fumes piped back into the the van from the exhaust pipe and then tipped into pits and, and buried in the nearby forest. So this is a form of selection for death by one way or another. So you say this particular ghetto was even more perfectly sealed off from the outside world than the Warsaw one, for example, which is the more famous, I suppose, of the two. It's poignant to find these personal stories within that. There's a quote, human life is miserable, but one still fights for it, which is a real testament to the human spirit, I think. And there's this changing nature, of course, with them wearing the yellow Star of David. Is that from 1941 onwards? In in Germany, the Yellow Star was only introduced in September 1941, but in Poland it was already introduced. In fact, white and blue armbands were introduced in the autumn of 1939, immediately following the invasion of Poland, and then those were replaced by the Yellow Star. So let's talk about one person in particular who I know you want to touch on. We're going to talk about one person in particular who's Melita Matchman, and she's a character who really features throughout your book in different contexts and different times but she's an interesting example of someone who's part of this bystander society that you talk about could you talk about her because i think she gives us a really interesting perspective of how something like a ghetto can come to be Melita Mashman is a young woman in the 1930s. Um, she goes to school in Berlin. She is frequently used, because she published her memoirs in 1963, and she's frequently used as an example supposedly showing what was typical for young women of her generation, uh, very taken up by the young women's organisation, the Bund Deutsche Mädel, the BDM, um, very enthusiastic, idealist, thinking she's building a better future for Germany. In the later 1930s, she betrays the older sister of one of her school friends. The older sister and the older sister's boyfriend, Gabriela, and her boyfriend, Hans, as a result, arrested, incarcerated in different camps. Later in the late 60s, Hans Seidel, in fact, commits suicide. He can't live with the memory of, of the experiences. Many historians use her as typical. She is not typical at all. I think she's quite unusual in that group. If you look at many of those young women at that time, OK, they do go along with the BDM. They do enjoy the camping and the hiking and the, the trips and so on. But she, I think, is more than just a bystander. She is complicit and she is, in my view, verging on perpetratorhood. She, however, shows us more interestingly how a lot of West Germans talked about this past in the 1960s. She was unusual in publishing her memoirs in 1963. Others didn't. But her memoirs show the very typical self-defence, self-legitimation strategies used by these bourgeois people now leading materially successful lives in post-war West Germany and how they can live with that past. The book is written in the form of letters to her former friend Mariana, who at that point she doesn't know if Mariana is alive or dead. In fact, Mariana has moved to America and has made a, 
a life for herself there. She's trying to connect with Mariana, trying to explain her past to Mariana. And she does it in a way which is actually quite sickening, but that is what is really very typical. She effectively argues that she was blinded by ideology. She, her youthful idealism was misused by members of an older generation. When she goes to look at the ghetto, she goes out to the Vaterland. She's part of this colonising, Germanizing wave, going there to teach young ethnic Germans to speak German properly, saying, you kids don't want to be shamed. Because that's by... the point, isn't it? Yeah. The moment that the, the ghettos are established and you get this, you know, it's, it's almost like a pushing back of a community then the places they've been pushed out from are being Germanized, aren't they? The, and it's to that which people like her are kind of feeling excited. She is contributing to this Germanizing process. So going to exclude the Poles, push the Jews out, Germanize the ethnic German population, teach them to speak German properly. And what she does, she sees the Wutch ghetto. She also sees the Kutno ghetto, a much smaller one. And she tries to have it both ways. For us as readers, she tries to portray herself as a sensitive soul who is upset by the plight of these poor people behind the fences, behind the wooden gates and so on. And so she tries to portray herself as a human being with sympathy for the plight of the suffering. And she portrays herself as being shocked at the casual disregard of other passers-by or people who might just be jeering and sneering and so on. But she says at the time she felt that, OK, well, this was important for the wider purpose. And she tells us that in Kutno she was surprised to see that many of the Jews in the ghetto had formerly been tailors or shoe repairers or carpenters or whatever, and that she was surprised to see they'd done ordinary jobs and that didn't quite square with the ideology of the rich Jewish capitalists. It's or striking the, me here yeah. that, in a way, she is typical, isn't she, in her reaction? Exactly. How long did this ghetto continue for did it survive the war or was was the jewish population exterminated from the litzmannstadt you're in, talking about in right? yes yeah. um no it's one of the longest lived ghettos because it was vital in terms of its industrial production and this was rumkowski's hope that if he there's a dreadful speech in which he tells people to hand over your children um hand me your children because he thought if he could get the children taken away and gassed you know the productive adult population would still be allowed to go on with no unnecessary eaters among them a horrific really heartrending. So it did go on for a long time because it was actually economically useful, but in the end that too was terminated. Rumkowski himself met a very sticky end in yeah, Auschwitz. Many so of them were deported to Auschwitz. A few people survived, not merely the final deportation to Auschwitz, but even the death marches and the deportation to other camps at the very end of the war. So you do get a few survivors from that ghetto. But Rumkowski in particular, there's that apocryphal story, and whether it's true or not, it, it does... I suppose, speak to a, a truth within the way that he was perceived by the Jewish community, that he was thrown straight into an oven even before he was gassed at Auschwitz. Is yes, that, this is, is right? the story that went around, what? that when Remkowski arrived in Auschwitz, the people there were so incensed by his behaviour and his reputation that they threw him alive into the oven rather than sending him first into the gas chamber. It's a story, whether it's that's true or not, really we don't matter. know, but whether it shows how incensed exactly. people were. Exactly. Yeah. So from that, I think we'll go and look at a contrasting one. Um, do you want to tell me about your, your second one? We'll, we'll leave the ghetto behind and analyse a different part of southern Poland. So we're moving now eastwards into the area known as the general government the Vaterland, which we've just been talking about, was incorporated into the Reich. The general government was set up as a, a quite sui generis entity. And in the general government, there is an area in southern Poland around Mieletz, which is totally unheard of, but in its very ordinariness, extremely typical, extremely revealing of the experiences in this period, both on the side of victims and of perpetrators. And it also becomes very important later in the post-war period in revealing the different ways in which Western East Germany dealt with the Nazi How would you characterise this area? Is it a rural... It's um, largely rural, pretty flat, very boring. 
some industry and in particular what's of interest to the Germans is that there's an aircraft works there which Heinkel takes over for aircraft manufacture. So for the Germans it becomes quite important in terms of aircraft production and indeed in terms of the rocket production that we more famously associate with Pinamunda, for example. Mm. Um, but it becomes significant in that respect in the German war effort. And this was overrun in September 1939 as well? September by... 1939, the Germans do what they do everywhere which is they invade, they terrorise the local population, they set the synagogue on fire with people in it, they slaughter people who are in, engaged in preparations for a particular annual festival. Um, so the synagogue burns, the flames are going all night, some of the Jews flee into the fields and, and watch the flames from afar. Um, people then try and settle down, get back into their ordinary lives, think the sheer terror of the invasion is over and things will normalise them themselves and they will just get on with it. The local population try and live as best they can. But what happens then in March 1942 is it's the first place in the general government from which a selection and deportation takes place to be selected for slave labour or gassing. So it's quite important in March 1942 for that. And in the centre of the town, Jews are rounded up, they're brought into the marketplace, they're selected there between the sick and the weak and the old, those who are not deemed to be economically useful, and those who will be walked to the nearby aircraft factory, now the Hankel aircraft works and used as slave labour in what's effectively at first a labour camp, later becomes formally a concentration camp. OK, and I know there's two particular individuals that you've looked at here because they've got instructive and contrasting stories. In Mirlets, like in many other areas, there is a small population of ethnic Germans, Volksdeutsche, living in a nearby village, Chermen, which is just outside Mirlets. One of the people in this little ethnic German colony, as they call it, is a guy called Rudy Zimmermann. He's the son of a farmer, quite poor family. And and he's, he's not highly educated, is he? He's very... Not he, he's not exactly intelligent. He's not well educated. He knows all the local Jews when they're kids. They play together. Yes, yes he's, he's well everyone. known all around yeah. and he knows everyone all around. So when the Germans invade, this is his moment. He suddenly becomes somebody because the local Gestapo think, aha, here we have somebody who speaks both German and Polish. He can act as our interpreter. And in March 1942, he's very helpful to the Nazis because he can go around pulling Jews out of their beds. He knows where all the Jews live. He can identify them. He can get an old sick man down the stairs and throw him into the town square to be deported to death, which he arguably doesn't know at that point himself that there is a gas. Uh, so his gas motive facility. for acting this way is a change in status, would you say, maybe? Because from being, you know, just another person who's not got anything extraordinary about him and perhaps he's a bit too ordinary, maybe, he's elevated into a position of power, which is, for him almost as intoxicating as that vision of like a national country was before with Melita. He's the one Nazi I've found who after the war really seriously seems to have it on his conscience and mm. feels pangs of guilt and nearly gives himself up in the early 60s but doesn't because he's worried about his wife and his four children. He, and comes, he comes across subsequently more thoughtful than he does yes, in this... Er I think he's just a young thug basically How at the time. Was he, at he was time? late teens, early 20s at this time. Yeah. And the... The boss, though, the Gestapo boss, this is the other character in this scene that I want to concentrate on, is someone who has come from Germany. And he is significant in the Nazi hierarchy, but not at the top. He takes his orders from Krakow and he passes the orders down. And as far as we can tell, he's an unpleasant man who takes a delight particularly in certain aspects of his job. So Zimmermann is sent to the Heinkel Aircraft Works to assist in killing Jews who've been selected as too sick or weak to work. He takes them from the aircraft hangar through the woods to the mass grave that they've dug. He shoots them into it. He can't stand doing this, but he feels he has to obey orders. And he doesn't get drunk before shooting them, which many people on the Eastern Front had to do. He only gets drunk afterwards to recover from it, to obliterate the memory because it's so bad. His boss, however, Walter Tormeyer, 
is the one who's giving him these orders, but also participating himself in the shootings. And Tormeyer is somebody who not only has this Jewish mistress, who he sees as a security person, a spy for him, effectively. Uh, that's how he's using her. But he also seems to great, take a great delight in shooting the women, getting them to undress and shoot them naked. He always reserves for himself the choice people he wants to shoot. So he's clearly taking a kind of sadistic delight in what he's doing. Where do we um, get information about this from? Is it from the later testimony or the court case? The information we have about all this is um, largely from later testimonies, the court cases in the late 1960s, but also survivor accounts. Presumably there won't be much photographic evidence from the time contemporary to these events. No, there is some photographic evidence, though there's quite a striking series of photographs of the town square and the selections in the town square and the first deportation and the people shuffling along with their miserable little bundles and standing around looking dreadful. So there's actually a very striking set of eight or nine photographs of that moment. Okay. So there's a picture of two contrasting characters there. Both perpetrators. Both perpetrators. But one again, I was wondering whether, whether there's a link, you know, as as the Jews were used to police themselves effectively in the ghetto, whether there's an, another instance here of the local population being used by the Nazis as accessories to the crimes they're trying to commit. Is that... That's that's not so evident here. This is a labour camp and they have no control over their conditions and surroundings. It is the Germans doing it to them. OK, so it is directly yeah. them doing yes. that. There's going to be a time of reckoning, isn't there, which comes in... Is it 1967 when there's information passed to the West 66. Germany? 66. 66. 66, Information's yes. passed and there's a court case instigated. So in those intervening years, 20 years, they've both been living separate lives in post-war Germany, one in the West, one in the GDR. Is that correct? Yeah. Rudyard Zimmermann, in fact, had two bosses sequentially in the Gestapo headquarters in Mierletz. One of them, Hensel, was the immediate predecessor of Tormeyer. Both Hensel and Tormeyer, the two bosses, went to West Germany. Both set up very nice bourgeois post-war lives, made nice salaries, um, were good middle-class West Germans. Hensel was never brought to court for reasons that I haven't been able to find out, so he disappears from the record in the mid-60s. Uh, Rudy Zimmermann went to East Germany and settled in what became the GDR, and he seems to have been racked with guilt and tried to work off his guilt by throwing himself into building communism. He becomes a member of the ruling Communist Party, the SED. He's somebody who's frequently recognised for his work. Um, he becomes a hero of work, an activist, and all these things. He he's gets all these medals perfect and perfect example so. of the Milgram and, experiment, isn't he? He's the, yeah, he, he follows, follows orders from above. Yeah, he follows orders, so he really throws himself into being a good citizen and he has four children and does everything to look after his family and his four children seems to be a very loving family father. I visited one of the sons, I looked at the family photo album, there are some lovely pictures of them when they were small and he was being a loving father and taking them on holiday and so on. So Rudy Zimmerman, I, it, it, it is strange to square that with what he had done just a few years earlier in following orders to kill Jews. It's extraordinary. But in 1966, investigations open into what was going on in this area and Rudy Zimmermann is caught up in the East German justice system and Walter Tormeyer in the West German justice system and their contrasting court cases are quite shocking to my mind. In East Germany, the judge does a very fair summing up, giving all due weight to the mitigating factors in Zimmermann's modest origins, but he's sentenced to life imprisonment. And he indeed spends the rest of his life in a GDR prison and dies in Under prison. Under quite close confinement as yes, well. Yes, in December 1988, he dies just months before the the fall of the wall, yeah. less than a year before the fall of the so wall. So he never regained his freedom. So okay. never regained his freedom. The judge, in his summing up of Tormeyer, looks at all the undoubted counts of murder that he had shot X number of people on this occasion and another number of people on that occasion, been responsible for the deaths of others, etc., etc., etc. And then he basically says, but he was only following orders from above. The real people who were guilty, the real person, perpetrators were those who had given him the orders and ultimately it was really Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich, the top 
people who are all dead. He was only following orders. He wasn't acting on his own initiative. He wasn't acting out of his own motivation. He wasn't acting with excess brutality. And the argument was made that when he was humiliating Jews in physical ways that were not necessarily part of the actual murder itself. He was acting in the interests of the regime, not in his own interests. And the one instance, and this is where I find the judgment the most absurd of all, the one instance where it seems that he was clearly acting out of his own interests was in shooting his Jewish mistress. He murdered his Jewish mistress when he was at risk of being found out for the crime, as it then was, of racial defilement, having sex with a Jew. And so he took her for a walk in the woods and shot her in the back of the neck when she was not expecting it. And the judge manages not to say he's acting in his own interests. The judge manages to wrap this up as, well, she was no longer useful as a spy or whatever, a vertrauens person, a person of confidence who could reveal things that he couldn't otherwise find out. She had lost her usefulness, so she had to be done away with, one. And two, and this is the thing that really I find extraordinary, that you could be, have a judge saying this in a West German court in the late 1960s, he had shown evidence of humanity in not letting her know before he shot her that he was about to murder her that he took her for a walk which she thought was just an amorous walk in the woods and shot her without letting her know beforehand and this shows fundamental humanity. East Germans, Nazis in East Germany were six or seven times more likely to be convicted for Nazi crimes than Nazis were in West Germany. Six or seven times more likely Absolutely. to be brought to court and sentenced Strike. and the sentences they received in East Germany were far more severe than the ones in West Germany. And not all trials in East Germany were just political show trials. There was a high degree of politicisation of justice in the East, but not all by any means were politicised. So I think the pursuit of former Nazis was more stringent and more comprehensive in East Germany than it was in West Germany. And this is something I found very surprising when I worked through these figures. I was really surprised at that. In the case of West Germany, it did not have a sufficiently comprehensive, differentiated attribution of guilt, but it did have this widespread public culture of shame and responsibility, moral responsibility for the past. So for the second generation, there was this incredible burden of a sense of shame without themselves ever having been guilty. And because those who were guilty tended to cover it up and say, I never knew anything about it, second generation sons of known perpetrators are more worried about what their father might have known than what their father had actually done. I look at the son of one of the perpetrators from the wider area around Mieletz who landed up in West Germany and who was not brought to court and his son was simply agonised in the 1990s about what his father might have known because his father had mentioned mass graves. What did he know about? What was he referring to? He wasn't so bothered about what his father had done. For Zimmermann's son, Zimmermann lives in the GDR. The GDR has this official state ideology of being the anti-fascist state and the poor innocent workers and peasants were misled by the, the fascists, the capitalists, the monopoly imperialist capitalists and so on. So the second generation in East Germany is not burdened with this sense of shame. Mm. And what happens in the case of Rudy Zimmermann's son is extremely interesting. He was a boy when his father was arrested. He remembers the day very well. I visited him in his house and he described the way in which the Stasi burst in and searched everything and went to talk to the neighbours and so on. Rudy Zimmermann's wife was present in the court case. She knew all about the court case. But she told her children that their father was a victim of GDR injustice. He was a victim of, she put it as a Stasi show trial. That's how she portrayed it. But the son grew up without this sense of being the son of a perpetrator. And he was amazing. I was so impressed by the way he and his wife dealt with this incredibly openly. I was 
the bearer of bad news, although I didn't know it before I went in. I thought, I'm doing an oral history interview to talk to what it feels like to be the son of a Nazi in the GDR. And it, I got in there and found out that I was actually telling him he was the son of a Nazi. Yeah, which, you know, uh, yeah. So it was a very strange conversation, but they were incredibly open and wanting to know what it was that they would need to deal with and wanting to understand it. Thormaya was released. Thormaya did... got 12 years, got which 12 is years. quite a long yeah. sentence, but, um, but given, given the, the number of counts of yeah. murder that he was indicted for, yeah. it was quite shockingly lenient. Well, both are really fascinating. I want to go from there to the third case, which um, we're going to look at a third episode, and this is at Auschwitz. And I think everyone has a, a general idea of, of what happened there. We don't need to describe it in the same way we've had to describe the ghetto. Or... We all know about Auschwitz. It's something that I try to contextualise in the book because we all know it was the largest extermination camp but also a massive complex of slave labour camps with a significant number of survivors from all around Europe. So we know a lot about Auschwitz. What I find very interesting about Mariana B's memoirs, she wrote them privately for her family in 1999 and a member of the family later deposited them in the German diary archive in Emmendingen. She was just living the life of an old woman in the Black Forest in a nice little village. Mariana B was, if you like, a slightly older version of Melita Mashman, who we've already talked about. She was a, a somewhat older young woman, um, already in her early 30s, by the time she was sent, she was a school teacher. She was trained as a school teacher. She had just turned thirty, and she was sent to the town of Auschwitz, Auschwitz, in the Germanized version, and took up her job there in the autumn of 1943. In her old age, what is really interesting is she wanted both to raise to attention the fact that she'd lived through a world historical moment in a world historical place, but at the same time she's writing very self-defensively to ward off the implicit criticisms of the grandchildren and of the wider public. The late 1990s, it's after the famous Wehrmacht Ausstellung, the exhibition on the crimes of the Wehrmacht in Germany in the mid-1990s, and it's um, a period when there is a much bigger conversation across three generations, now not just the second, but the third generation, grandchildren asking their grandparents, why, what did you know and why didn't you do anything about it at the time? So she's writing in that cultural context and in that sense I find it very interesting as a um, a sort of contrast to Melita Mashman but also demonstrating the continuity of certain defensive strategies. She is a school teacher she, she is teaching in the school where the children of Rudolf Huss, the commandant, the commandant of Auschwitz, yeah. are going to school. She is in charge of these little children. She's shocked on the first day when she becomes aware that terrible things are happening. She is shocked that the children come to school saying th there were again Jews on the ramp being selected for the camp and this was terrible. And she says in her memoir, why did the children have to see this? What could she say? Why could this not be done in secret somewhere differently so that the little children weren't exposed to it? What an extraordinary way of describing that, that she's concerned about the little German school children having to witness it, not concerned about what's going on. She then, in her memoir, goes on with a kind of double strategy of pretending that she didn't really know. She comes home one day, her furniture is covered in ash. The landlady says, well, the wind is coming from Auschwitz. It's not coming from the the industry of IG Farben, just a little bit north in their Buna factory in one of its. It's coming actually from Birkenau, so it must be burning again today. And she pretends to be shocked. She pretends to be horrified. She has some quite sickening statements about this beautiful ash and was it a sign to me from... etc. So she pretends knowledge and sympathy with victims. She is going to dinner parties with wives of SS officers who work in the camp. At one dinner party, the SS officer has to go back to do his duty on the ramp again. And, you know, so she intimates the proximity of knowledge and then pretends she doesn't know because it was all behind the gates and she couldn't get. So she's 
absolute the epitome of this notion that evil is always a little bit one step further away from us. We couldn't really know about it. We really knew nothing about it because it was always the true heart of evil was always just that little one further step away from us. Was it written for herself, do you think, this piece? Or was She's it, is 86... It just, is there a bit of boasting going on? She was like, it's like, oh, I was in Hiroshima in August 45. I was in New York on September mm. 11th. Is it a bit like that? Uh, she was 86 when she wrote it. I think many people in old age want to have a reckoning with their life and it's a form of reckoning with her life but it's also a self-defensive form of justifying it she's intimating that there were reasons why she kept silent she couldn't let the young men fighting at the front know about this because it would affect the morale of the troops and the fatherland was in peril at war and so on so she's portraying herself as a good patriot in wartime and she's also trying to imply that if she didn't really know so close, then how could anyone else have known further away? So she's trying to be self-defensive about the wider German people. And I think she's doing it because there is this little bit of us that wants to say, my life was worthwhile, I did important things, I was in incredible places, and I don't want to feel compromised by that. But she's trying to say, look, I was somebody, I was somewhere, this was important, this was a moment of history, I was present at it mm. and yet I didn't really know so nobody could have known and yet I did know but I couldn't tell anyone because it would have been unpatriotic to affect the morale of the troops at the front and and so on so it's immensely conflicted but yeah. I think it does portray beautifully what an ordinary woman an educated woman a former school teacher in her her mid 80s at the end of her life is feeling about living in a country with young people who are saying what on earth did you do and why didn't you do anything against it it, it it is a, a very, very interesting document in that respect. Exactly, and I suppose it, what you do throughout the book, come back to time and again, is explode. One of the things that we hear so often about the Holocaust is that no one knew it was happening. And this page after page after page is disproved. And it's almost the idea that ripples up. I was thinking of Robert Harris's book, Fatherland, when he talks about the Jews just going to the East and no one knew what happened to them. This is the novel which is set in the fictitious future when the Nazis had won the war in the 60s or something like that. And they just disappeared. It's an enormous achievement. So we're going to leave the scenes there. And thank you very much for telling us about them today. I've got a question, uh, a supplementary question though, that we ask of everyone that comes on this podcast, and um, it might be more difficult in your case, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless. Um, if there was a tangible object that you could bring back to 2019 as some kind of memento of our conversation today through time, what would it be? Well, there are two answers to that. If there were a tangible memento that I would bring back, I would try and bring back everyone to life. That is the fundamental problem of this period. It's not a period you want to bring back in the way that it is at all. It is just so devastating in its scope and it, in its continuing consequences um, and its consequences for many victim groups that were never recognised, never compensated, um, never fully remembered. In that sense, it's not a period that you could even want to bring a memento back from um, but I thought I have to play by the rules of the game this is like <laughs> Desert Island Discs okay. so I thought I would bring back a tangible object and what I have brought I picked up on a market stall in Krakow and actually the buying of it in a sense epitomises the continuing problems with this this is a very small little booklet from the time um, which is entitled the Führer's Struggle in the East. It's a very small booklet. It's about one and a half inches by two inches. It's or a tiny thing, isn't it? Two yeah. centimetres by three centimetres. It's full of beautiful photos of bright-eyed, fresh-faced youth going east. The Führer looking magnanimous and... Um, well-intentioned building projects, work projects, poring over maps, handing over places. And what it is doing for the German public at the time is whipping up both enthusiasm and funding for the whole Germanisation process of the East. Why do I have it in my possession? A really ghastly little bit of Nazi propaganda that is 
yet so apparently benevolent and appealing because when I was going around Krakow and visiting those remaining synagogues in the former Jewish quarter there is a marketplace there and on the market stalls they were selling not merely quite anti-semitic caricatures of Jews with hooked noses holding big coins which I was told were uh, good luck symbols and lots of Poles have them on their mantelpiece and so on they were selling these little leftover tidbits from the Nazi period. This would have been somebody's who went on living there and when they died and they did the attic clearance it would have just been cleared out. And the market stall holder um, from whom I bought it got very angry because my son was filming the transaction and jumped over the table and kicked my son and tried to pull the camera out of his hands and shouted and screamed at us And because basically they are making money out of Nazi memorabilia and yet are having fundamental problems with coming to terms with this past which still informs the the character of Polish-Jewish relations today. Well, I think looking at this, it's just to describe it because we're, uh, we're we've got our listeners. It's smaller than a matchbox, and I mean it's quite beautifully printed in a really obscene way, isn't it? And the the fact that it's so small is really revealing that it was meant just to be carried by the ordinary person. Now, that's the whole like power of it, really. Because if it was a great big folio volume in the British Library, it wouldn't be much mm. good. But this is the essential power you know this is like the currency of hate thank you very very much for taking the time to talk to us congratulations on being the wolfson prize winner for 2019 and it's been a really illuminating hour thank you thank you very much that was me peter moore talking to the 2019 wolfson history prize winner professor mary fulbrook about her book Reckonings, Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice. If you'd like to explore more historical work on the Holocaust, then please do visit our Travels Through Time webpage, which you'll find on historytoday.com. And there you'll find links to lots of other articles written by experts in their field in the world's leading serious history magazine. I'm going to be back with another podcast in a fortnight's time. But for now, and from me, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.